So uh, my background for a, lot, for a number of years, I was doing uh, wireless system design at, at Qualcomm and also software development there. Uh, for the last year, I've been working on the open wireless router uh, at the EFF. Uh, and actually, this project that we're talking about is a little bit related to, related to that. Um, and uh, I'll let Andrew introduce himself. I'm Andrew Wong. I just graduated college, essentially, and now I'm working in Sunnyvale at Raytheon. Okay, so uh, I'll, I'll actually show you a little bit about what we built for the router. It'll give you some motivation for why we're doing this, but just uh, bear with me until then. We'll just talk about you know what, what it is we try to do here. So the idea is that you know, with the uh, Bitcoin um, blockchain-based system, you can do order fulfillment without uh, necessarily having payment processing servers. Uh, so obviously, we know that you can just send money peer-to-peer. -peer, that's no issue. But uh, normally, when people implement the fulfillment part of it, they usually work with a you know payment processor, whether it's BitPay, you know, whatever, and you know their server infrastructure. And I think that happened because people grafted existing ways of order fulfillment, which are based on uh, proof of payment, to uh, uh, fulfill the order. So basically, they mashed together the old system based on fiat with the Bitcoin-based system. And that's what you see prevalent today. And uh, for, the, for the router, uh, uh, I'll, I'll explain why, but you know, I was looking at uh, people who got this router paying an annual, you know, software uh, maintenance fee, and um, for that, you know, uh, some of the uh, sort of normal requirements for sort of instant order fulfillment on the web didn't apply, and so we could use Bitcoin sort of in a in a neat way uh, to actually both uh, simplify the things for the uh, vendor and also improve privacy. So the vendor can actually take advantage that uh, the blockchain itself uh, can be the payment processor. Uh, and, and what this uh, uses is that in many real world transactions, there is actually a natural delay between payment and order fulfillment. Um, and so you know the uh, 10 minutes that it takes to confirm the transaction on the blockchain is actually not an issue. So we are talking about delays that are you know, days, months, or, you know, could be a year, even, or, or more. And, um, yeah, and, and so um, uh, w what happens here is, after the payment is done, the payment record is already on the blockchain. That's established. So what's needed is for the payer to come and claim that payment and say, I'm the one who actually paid this, so please fulfill the order. So you kind of flip the things instead of, um, uh, sort of proof of payment, you want the payer to identify themselves and, and prove that they in fact made that payment. And so we call that uh, a, a token that the uh, payer can generate, uh, I they call, they call it the I am payer token. And, and so um, uh, uh, the, we'll explain how that works. And basically the benefits of this is, you know, reduced cost for the vendor, and there is no interaction between the payer and the vendor at the time of payment. So the vendor doesn't need to have servers, you know, the payer just sends the money to an address, and I'll explain how that works, and, and the only interaction is if the fulfillment is being done, you know, through some online thing, then there's some interaction with the vendor servers, sometimes the fulfillment does not involve any um, internet infrastructure, in which case there would be no interaction on the internet and we'll give, we'll show you an example of that <clears throat> so so there are two cases that that we looked at one is uh, what it first described which is an annual software maintenance fee for in this case the router and the the second is uh, 
uh, for event tickets, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about both of those. So the first one, <coughs> the way it would work is the vendor would create a well-known address. And in, in the case of the router, this would actually be embedded in the router software. So from the payer's point of view or customer's point of view, they don't even need to know anything about it at all. It's, it's just there in the software. And then you know the, the, the um, uh, customer has the um, uh, you know already has the key, and then at some point you know so let's say January fifteenth is is when it's normally due. Uh, so sometime in in the prior year, they would make the payment to the well known address, and then come January fifteenth, what happens is the the router actually currently every night it goes and checks for software updates it goes and checks for the metadata describing the software update and that is done in a very private way over the tar network and i'll explain why but it would do that what it does every night and it's just that on january 15 when it does that the server would respond with okay i want to know whether you actually made the annual payment so what it does is it sends a nonce uh, back to the router and the router would then generate the token of uh, the format is shown below which includes the nonce uh, signs it with the uh, uh, key private key corresponding to the address from which the payment was made and sends it to the um, uh, uh, vendor uh, and then the vendor would use that to validate that this uh, payer actually made the payment that they're claiming. So if you look at the token, there's the sending address from which the money was sent, the transaction hash, the actual payment block height where the transaction was recorded, uh, a refund address, and then the nonce. So from the server's point of view, all, all they would need to do is look in the specific block, so they don't need to go search anything, they go, go, check the, go to the specific block, look for a transaction with that hash, and check whether uh, the required amount of money was sent from that sending address into the well-known address. And if it was, you know, make sure that this message is actually signed with the private key corresponding to the sending address, because that now establishes that this person actually was the owner of that payment. And, and uh, they do that, and then they do a duplicate check, which is like, they don't want to see this token a second time. So this needs to be the first time that this particular payment is being claimed. And, and if that is true, then they fulfill the order. So, so that's it. So what, the key thing here is in the middle part in the payment, there's no interaction with the, with the vendor. The interaction happens in this case only when the software needs to be downloaded. Now for the event ticket, I'll let Andrew explain how that works. So for our event ticket implementation, it's essentially the same thing. It's easy, if not easier, than the current process with fiat money. You send money to your send money to our mobile wallet, which we'll have we'll have a custom fork wallet. Then you pay the vendor, uh, the event organizer. And then, in order to prove your payment, you just select your transaction. And you scan it on their computer, and then you're admitted. That's it. So now the vendor no longer has to use Coinbase or BitPay, and they don't have to print out their ticket. They can just use their phone. Bam, they're admitted. Easy. That's the whole value proposition. Uh, all of that is largely the same as the software redemption. So you know, one of, we spent a lot of time like thinking through the protocol. You'll see like earlier, you know, we have this nonce, and, and, and you, you might ask like why all this is. We can we can get into that, um, but um, part of that was also that we realized that this doesn't preserve much privacy for the event organizer. So you know how much money went into you know as tickets, uh, and then it's also not the Bitcoin way of doing things because if one person is not maintaining privacy, then you know it affects everybody else. So, so I think uh, uh, Andrew pointed this out, and so we spent just yesterday trying to figure out: okay, can can this actually be made to work in a better way? 
and there is. So stealth addresses solve exactly the problem that we need to solve here. So instead of putting a well-known address, you would add, uh, the event organizer would, uh, would put out the event public key. And then the customer would actually, instead of making a normal payment, they would make a stealth payment. So you know, if, if somebody is interested, we can explain if you, if you don't know what stealth payments are. And what that does is now the customer is actually sending, different customers are sending their payments to different addresses, which they are generating and only the vendor or the event organizer knows potentially what that other address is. So they essentially <coughs> scan the entire blockchain, find all of them that actually correspond to them, and they are able to get that money. And nobody observing this actually knows that, you know, the event organizer is getting paid, which of the transactions correspond to that, and, and, and we kind of maintain sort of the anonymity that we want in the, in the Bitcoin network. Um, so for the demo, let me just uh, just walk through what was the motivator for all of this, which was uh, this router software. So we launched this router for, uh, software uh, at the EFF like last year to be reflashed onto like an existing uh, specific router model. And really the focus was three things, uh, security, speed, and sharing. And, 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 and really we started out with Sharing meaning like people having an open wireless channel in their homes uh, that they could share with passers-by, uh, with anybody who kind of needs it in an emergency. And, and uh, the problems we needed to solve was they would be concerned about their own experience being impacted. They would be concerned about security con from allowing strangers to connect to their network. And, and so um, we developed uh, a new web UI because a lot of the security problems for ours come from the web UI. Uh, it's it's basically a Python backend with you know HTML5 JavaScript uh, you know designed for mobile um, and um, it's, it's just two screens. The first is a dashboard, which you know if you came to you would come there because the router is not working properly or whatever. You want to get some diagnostic information, so we have that there. Uh, and then the key thing is security. So that's that's been the the biggest chunk of the work that we did there. So a lot of router firmwares firmware is out there today, almost everyone is compromised and, and can be easily hacked into. So security is very poor in this product segment. So we decided to build like a really secure um, router software. So for example, you see here, on, on the dashboard, you see the last login, with what IP address and what time that was from. You see that there's uh, w uh, an update check that is done, right? Like I said, every night it checks for update. In fact, it checks you know, every hour and then actually you know, reflashes it at night, but you can also do a manual check to see if the software is up to date. The key, the key part of security is like, you know, auto, automatic software updates. So, you know, we focused on that. So, and then um, uh, the way the software updates are done um, uh, is, is, is actually, um, like I mentioned, we, the star on the router, it goes over the tar network uh, to the uh, EFF server uh, to ask for the metadata for what the latest software is. So at the EFF server, we don't, we cannot distinguish one router from the other. So we cannot send targeted malware to anybody even if we get a government warrant that you know you need to do that. So we just don't know who's who. So that was the point of using tar, and 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 so um, uh, once the uh, uh, metadata is fetched, you know, it's, it's, it's validated from using key, uh, public key that is stored in the router, and, and then, you know, the firmware is fetched. Um, uh, the other part of, uh, was, you know, routers normally have, like, password logins. So we, we didn't, we wanted to avoid that. That's one of the uh, vectors for compromise. So we have only public key-based SSH login, and you don't see it here, but when you set it up, you can actually upload your public key, and then you know um, you lock it, and then it's only like one machine that can lock in, log in. So I'll, I'll, you'll see why I'm explaining that. Um, and then into the other security features, you can send, you know, both the open wireless traffic or the private the network traffic over Tor or VPN. So so you can do that. So the key point is, you know, we really engineered this for security. So. Um, 
let me just go over now to the router. So once you upload the public uh, SSH key, you know, you can log in to the router. And um, what I was able to do, let me show you the router. What did I do? Yeah. So you see the, there's a USB key in there. That USB key is actually holding an Electrum wallet. And like I said, we have Python on there. So I was able to get Electrum running on the router. So and um, this is just to kind of show you how, how I had set up the wallet. So this is not a great user experience from a user point of view, you know, having to log in and all that to either handle the wallet or make a payment. But I think for a demo, it's fine. We could, you know, move it to the web UI at some point. But this is just Electrum in text mode running on the router. And you see these are uh, the addresses available. So I labeled like a couple of them. One is main and another is like software maintenance, right? Uh, so, and the nice thing is actually if, if somebody wanted to like work with this wallet, they don't actually have to go on the router because I basically take the dot electrum folder and you know, I have it as a separate partition and I mount it. So you could just put it on your laptop, mount it, and then you could use electrum on your laptop to, to you know, work with it. Okay. So, and uh, so anyway, normally, uh, like let's say you want to make an annual payment in December, it's coming up, you, you like the software, you want to make sure you're not losing your software updates, so you do, you know, you just, there's, there's a script that, that, that would be on the router, it just says, you know, pay the annual maintenance fee. And uh, what I'm using is, you know, Electrum has a command line. Uh, uh, you know, so I'm using the Electrum command line to basically do this. So um, what it does is it looks through your wallet and it says, it looks for uh, address with the label software maintenance. So it says, I found this address with software maintenance. Uh, use this, okay? So you say yes. And then it says enter the payment amount, you know, 0.1 BTC is the, is the normal annual maintenance fee. And you know, if you, if you really like the software, maybe you can put 0.2 or 1 BTC, whatever you like. And then you say, uh, sending point of BTC. And so now in order to allow the payment to go through, you need to unlock the payment. So, unlock, I mean, with, with the password, unlock the, for Electrum to do that. And uh, that's actually stepped out. It's not connected to the network, but um, uh, what it does after completing the payment is it generates the token stub. And I'll, I'll, I'll show you what that is. So. So the token stub is is just these top four things. So the sending address, transaction hash, payment block height, refund address. So it just takes all of that, you know, packs it as a uh, as binary data, um, and then you know just stores it at a well-known location. So when the router would you know come January 15th when it goes and it gets the challenge, which is the you know it's the nonce comes back, it puts the stub together with the nonce and then signs it with the private key corresponding to the address from which the payment was sent and then you know sends the token over so and um, do you want to talk a little bit about the how much more time do you have Ranga? <coughs> just like a couple of minutes okay Let, let's wrap it up pretty quick yeah do you want to say something about the, the software how we okay so yeah, I think that's it. So any questions? Why what, what do, do you need a nonce on this but not on the other or wait for the event? Okay, can you repeat the question? So why a nonce in this protocol and not in the one for the event ticket? So w the purpose of the nonce was for the vendor to be able to prove when they reject somebody as a duplicate that it is in fact a duplicate. So. Basically, if they actually served somebody the first time, then they will have the signed token with the original nonce, nonce number one, stored away. Somebody comes and presents the same token again, but now with a different nonce, right? So they go back, they do their check in the database, and say, hey, we already paid this. 
Okay, so they say rejected. But let's say they dispute it. They say, no, 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 how did that happen? Like, you know, I, I never claimed this before. So then they can pr produce the older one and say, hey, I have the signed thing with your signature on this earlier knots. Right? So that was the purpose of this thing. We, when we talked about the event ticket, the complication was slightly different, and Andrew can explain. When you do the event ticket, you just want QR code scan. That's it. With the knots, you have to go back and forth. There's an additional step. And so we decided it was acceptable to avoid that step. But the issue still exists, right? No, so here's the other thing. So we realized that in the case of software, it's hard to prove actually that in the final step, that let's say the vendor says fine, the token is fine, I'm going to serve you the software. There is no way for the vendor to prove that the software was actually received, right? So on the other hand, when we talk about the event, the situation was different. So do you want to explain that you could have a third party? Yeah, okay. yeah. so so we, we can, we can, so we can have a third party camera that's monitoring all the things that are going in. And that's actually a better guarantee that, you know, there's not like uh, the vendor cheating in any way. And that actually eliminates the need for the protocol, the nonce and everything going back and forth. And so it's kind of, that's, that's the right way to do it. So one, one use case, you might say, okay, why is this easier? Well, typically it's okay to have a centralized server, right? But if anyone has ever gone to the DEF CON hacking conference, what they do is they don't accept credit cards and there's no server, there's no online payment. It's cash only. Kind of silly. But they don't want a paper trail of who attended the conference and who ha holds all the money. And so this application is aiming to be as close to an alternative as cash as possible, but still easy and still fast. Now, uh, now people can claim payments really easily and they can pay anonymously if they use the stealth address feature. One quick note, so, you know, lines on DEF CON on the first day, there's 15,000 people who go to the conference. In a cash-only system, you know, literally people wait for hours to get in. And so, in fact, you know, I know some of the DEF CON organizers, I told them, hey, we got this cool idea, prototype, and, and would you be interested in trying to use it? And he said, well, I forwarded it to right, right yeah. people and we'll let you know. I think, I think uh, you've taken your time. Okay. So, okay, sorry. So. One quick shot. Paparazzi moment. Real story, guys. Um, two nights ago, oh. 